These days, everyone loves the GameCube, bathing in its nostalgic glow. When, oh when, will Nintendo bring us GameCube games on Switch and let us relive the honeyed days of our youth? Well, Pa says Nintendo, you don't deserve the GameCube. You might claim to love it now, but you didn't back then when it was outsold by the PS2 at 7 to 1. Nintendo still hasn't forgiven us, and maybe they're right to, because it is wonderful, and I'm going to take a look at some of the games that pushed it to its limits. Not a definitive list, a sample of the more impressive games, and maybe we'll learn a bit about how it works too. Let us start then with F-Zero GX. A strong starting point, I think, because yeah, this still looks really good, doesn't it? Is this how far we haven't come in the last 20 odd years? Yes, you might be able to tell this is captured from the real hardware and not enhanced in any way, but it still stands up and it still looks, well, pretty striking. Probably the biggest tell that this is an old game is the resolution. Yes, this is pre-HD standard definition era, but at least it does make full use of what can be done with that. Running at 480p and in native widescreen mode, yes, I haven't just stretched out the aspect ratio like a philistine, this is how it is supposed to be. But it's more than just the technical image quality that makes this look so good. The previous generation of consoles, the first dedicated 3D systems, well they all had their own issues, giving games from those days a very characteristic glitchy look. This new era though pretty much banished the wonky geometry, low resolution textures, short draw distances and all the other ugliness, led by the GameCube which was for a while arguably the most powerful console you could buy. 3D graphics are made from polygons, 2D shapes stitched together into models then filled out with textures, and the GameCube is really good at doing that. Previous gen consoles could maybe handle about 2000 polygons per frame at 60 frames per second, give or take. That was all you could muster to draw everything with, character models, scenery, the lot. The GameCube though could handle 10 times that easily, and maybe much more, tens of thousands of polygons per frame being the norm. But on top of that we've also got lighting, shadows, reflections, bloom and many other effects that add to the scene, and the GameCube is pretty good at that too. The GameCube's GPU, codenamed Flipper, was made by PC graphics card developer ATI, now part of AMD, but it is quite a bit different from any sort of modern GPU, certainly anything you'd find in a PC. It's still pretty capable though of quite a lot of advanced effects, something that F-Zero makes plenty of use of, and something that is still pretty tricky to emulate at times. Yes, there's a reason why I've gone for the real hardware, because emulation still doesn't quite cut it. Dolphin, the big GameCube and Wii emulator, amazing as it is, still struggles to bring perfect recreations of this and many other games on modern hardware. Yes, this game runs at 60 frames per second on the GameCube, but you'll need a pretty beefy system to guarantee that with Dolphin, and even then there can still be imperfections. And it's the rock solid performance with all the craziness going on that still makes F-Zero impressive, and no doubt at least part of the reason why we still haven't seen a new mainline game in the franchise since this one is just so hard to top. The first game developed by Sega in partnership with Nintendo, totally unthinkable even just a couple of years before, but they absolutely nailed it, the beginning of a long and productive cooperation between the two companies. Let's move on now though, but we'll stick with racing games for the moment, and take a look at Need for Speed Carbon. A game that maybe brings us down to earth a bit, because yeah, this still looks pretty good, but it does remind us more of what the last 20 years of advancing graphics technology has done. The neon fantasy world of F-Zero puts the GameCube in its best light, but when it attempts something more realistic, well, the flaws do start to show a little more. Despite the burgeoning popularity of open world games in the early 2000s, led of course by Grand Theft Auto, the GameCube pretty much missed out on that trend. Yes, GTA never made it to the GameCube, 
but there's not really anything else like it either. The only titles that give us any sort of expansive, free-roaming city environments involve racing or skating. Need for Speed Carbon might not be the best racing or skating game on the GameCube, but it might well be the most impressive graphically. Yes, it's got that, well, I want to say cheesy mid-2000s vibe to it, but, well, EA are probably still making games very much like this. The cutscenes are, well, not so much Uncanny Valley as hopelessly lost in the uncanny Mariana Trench. Is that real people or CGI? Well, let's, let's just not dwell on it. The gameplay graphics are the most important bit here and they definitely are impressive. It's all set at night with lots of lovely lighting. The GameCube's GPU allowed for up to eight simultaneous light sources in hardware, but it could have more with clever programming, and this game's engine really goes to town, in town, with lots of dynamic light sources. The street lights, the car headlights, they all light up the scene and illuminate what they fall on, but what they don't do most of the time is cast shadows. As was common at the time, most of the shadows are baked in, fixed as part of the textures. In the case of the cars, there does seem to be a single faint shadow from one global light source, but in the dark of the city at night, this all works and all looks good. What's also impressive is the environment mapping on the cars, the reflections in the paintwork. It might not be geometrically perfect, but it does actually reflect what is around the car, not just a vaguely appropriate image as many games of this era did. This game really does show what the GameCube is capable of. In terms of raw power, it definitely had it by the standards of the time. This game ended up being ported everywhere, including the PS2, and the GameCube version does look better. Not loads better, but it seems to be higher resolution maybe, or perhaps better anti-aliasing. In fact, not always, but often on cross-platform games where they were on both systems, the GameCube does come out better. That really is impressive when you consider how much bigger the PS2 was sales-wise. Sony's platform was a major focus for nearly every developer back then, and the old Cube would have been much more of an afterthought, a quick port rather than the lead version. So I suppose if we really want to see the most impressive stuff, we should probably head towards games that were tailor-made for the GameCube specifically, like Resident Evil 4. This is a big one, isn't it? Debuting exclusively on the GameCube and developed by Capcom, this is still the GOAT horror survival game in many gamers' eyes. It's atmospheric, it's stylish, it's oozing with artistry, and it's also quite hard. I'm afraid my gameplay footage is going to consist mostly of me being repeatedly slaughtered by zombies, but long-time viewers of this channel will know not to expect much of my skills. I think this is supposed to have a 4-3 aspect ratio, so not widescreen, but... Confusingly, it's got black bars at the top and bottom, possibly to add a cinematic edge, but also maybe to help performance. Cutting down the visible screen area cuts the amount of polygons that need to be drawn, so less work for the GPU. And this game is heavy on the polygons. The models are very complex. Looking at this wireframe mode in Dolphin with all the textures stripped away, you can see that, yeah, this is an intricately crafted world. A lot's going on under the surface. Compare this with F-Zero and you'll see, well, something that does have less complex geometry. And for an even more stark comparison, compare it with something like Beetle Racing on the N64, a much, much simpler world. You'll need to be smarter than me to properly understand Dolphin's built-in statistics, but that also points to more complexity. Then again, Resident Evil does run at 30 frames per second, not 60. That complexity is a trade-off. Some of the smoothness is sacrificed. There's other effects too, light sources, especially later in the game, so I'll probably not get to see most of them, and some nice flame effects and explosions too. 
There are vague shadows which are pretty hard to spot at the best of times, especially as everything seems to happen from the waist up for some reason. There's also a real wealth of details in the environment, in the textures that are the fabric of it. A lot of earth tones, it's all pretty muted, shadowy and rustic looking, but often quite lifelike. Previous Resident Evil games had of course gone for pre-rendered background scenes mostly, that was sort of its thing, so this game has to work quite hard to look as good aesthetically. And it manages partly because this is a two disc game, so the developers had more space to work with, including plenty of room for textures relatively speaking. The GameCube's disc format, they looked like mini DVDs, though strictly their Nintendo's proprietary formats, but they're the same thing basically, with a capacity of around 1.3 gigabytes. In the early part of this generation, that was absolutely fine, but as time went on, both the PS2 and then the Xbox really began to make use of the extra space allowed by DVDs. The extra cost and probably just the general irritation of using multiple discs meant that no GameCube game was ever supplied on more than two, which did hold it back a bit. The GameCube could probably handle something like the PS2's God of War in terms of its base graphical power, but it would have had to come on eight discs, which would have been a bit silly. So Resident Evil 4 is perhaps the finest of the big cinematic experience type games you'll get on the GameCube, making fine use of its 2.6 GB storage budget. Compared to previous generations that is quite a lot, but well, compared to the competition, not so much. But now let's strike out in a bold new direction and look at a game that is the polar opposite of the Merc of Resident Evil. Yes, Land Ho, it's Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. A game that caused a bit of consternation when it was announced because of its cell-shaded style. Primitive, simplistic, childish, kiddie, that was what some annoyed fans called it. Expectations were confounded, especially after the more gritty-looking Zelda tech demo that Nintendo had shown off a few years earlier. Subjectively, you can say what you like, although these days fans do seem to be much more positive about its looks, but, well, whatever you think of the Wind Waker's graphics, they are anything but simple. Yes, Nintendo didn't miss stuff out, they didn't just sort of dial back the image quality to something less complex for aesthetic reasons, they actually made very clever use of the GameCube's capabilities to give the game this unique look. YouTuber Jasper has an absolutely fascinating video about the Wind Waker's cell shading and he explains it all far better than I could ever hope to, so watch that if you want the real story about how it all works. But the key thing, the thing that really makes the cell shading look work though, is the hard lines of colour, like you get in traditional animation. And that includes the shading that the lighting effects give rise to. The play of sunlight on Link's face here is a beautiful illustration of that, and on the GameCube this is made possible thanks to its TEV, the Texture Environment Unit in the GPU, which allows multiple layers to be combined into one texture in a complex way. Now outside there's just one global light source, the sun, makes sense, but the best part, the most sophisticated bit are the lights in the interior locations. These rooms like here in Tetra's pirate ship are often lit by lamps, and these lamps have interesting properties. Most games of this era just use directional lights, that is, light sources that are outside of the scene projecting light in one particular direction. The Wind Waker's lamps though are point sources, they project light in all directions from the centre of the light source, or at least they seem to very nicely. So yeah, we've got these yellow patches on the wall and floor that look like pools of light, a cartoony effect to help sell things, but also notice how Link is lit up as he moves around the light. 
The side facing the light is always lit round the full 360 degrees and when he ducks down more of his back is lit as well. And yes, his shadow follows around too, always pointing away from the lamp. And yes, just to really drive the point home, some of these lights move as well. There's only ever one light source active on Link at once, there's never two shadows, but wow, this is a really nice simulation of a point light source. There are many modern games that don't go this hard on light sources. Nintendo really went all out on this one. There's plenty of other effects worth noting too, loads of them. The depth of field effect, really noticeable outside where distant objects are blurred. And also the fog and haze effects, the wind, the waves, the insanely detailed animation in everything which all adapt to the environment. Yes, Link's feet actually touch what he's walking on, a minor detail that a lot of games lack. For my money, this is the best Zelda game on the GameCube, and there is a bit of choice. Apart from ports of the Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, there is of course the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Opinions of this do seem to be reversed from The Wind Waker. Initially, it was much better received, a more naturalistic looking Zelda, one closer to what fans of the time wanted, a sort of next-gen Ocarina of Time rather than a bold new direction. Now though, its style does seem to have fallen out of favour a little bit, it's maybe dated more than The Wind Waker has. Still a darn good game though, beyond my criticism and amazing looking in its own unique way. And of course, good enough to be released basically unchanged as a Wii game too. Two generations in one. I don't know about you, but I think I've had enough of Zelda for now. I'll leave a more detailed commentary on this one for another video. Instead, let's not hang around any longer. Let's go straight into the daddy of GameCube limit pushing games, Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike. Created by Factor 5, the German team that evolved from Rainbow Arts, the people responsible for the Amiga versions of the Turrican games, amongst other things. And here they brought that same energy to the GameCube and also a lot of very authentic Star Wars energy too. So much so there's a serious danger of content matching with all the music and sound effects and what have you. That's something you don't really need to worry about as a viewer though, but there is fairly solid circumstantial evidence that this is a limit pusher, because this is a game that the Dolphin emulator still really chokes on. If you've got reasonably modern hardware, most other games are totally playable, if not absolutely flawless. This though, well it's tough to get it running well. Why? Well, lots of polygons to begin with, 150,000 per frame is what I've seen quoted, which is a lot, and the frame rate is variable, but it is pretty good. That's not the sole reason though, you see the game also uses a lot of advanced effects. These aren't things that modern systems can't do, it's just that they struggle to do them in the way that the GameCube did, which is what you need for emulation. But that is sort of tangential to what the actual GameCube is doing and, well, that's what we're here for and that's what we're watching now, actual GameCube footage. Okay, it's actually running on my Wii, but, well, that makes no difference other than it's easier for me to capture the footage. But that aside, what does this do that makes it so special? Well, kind of obvious, but it looks great, doesn't it? It looks really good. I mean, yeah, that's a bit vague, but... It does, there's absolutely loads happening on screen and in the most action-packed parts it's absolutely littered with enemies, energy beams and all the other sci-fi detritus. There's also lots and lots of lighting effects, everything lights up everything else. There's some pretty glorious water effects too, taking advantage of the TEV unit's ability to combine textures, a eh? sort of a heaping serve of awesomeness, really, that makes this one of the standouts of this generation graphically. But looking at this game to begin with, I kept getting the feeling that there was something else, some other special thing about these graphics that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Something that made it more realistic, more natural, maybe. 
certainly more than other games of its generation. But with a bit of internet searching, I think I might have managed to nail it down because this game does two things in particular that make it very unusual for its time. The first thing is self-shadowing, and as the name suggests, that means that the 3D models in this game are able to cast shadows on themselves. Most games of the time, if they do have shadows, it's just a sort of a flattened black outline of the model projected only onto the ground. It looks fine, but it's not totally realistic. But in Rogue Squadron, this X-Wing's various parts cast shadows on the other parts of it. The upper wings cast shadows on the lower wings, and that goes for the other models in the game too. Not the kind of thing you might really notice consciously, but it adds a subtle extra layer that helps to make what you are seeing more believable, more lifelike. There's also a further touch of reality thanks to bump mapping, a technique that simulates bumps, ridges or whatever in a flat texture by encoding information about the height into the surface. This gif I've shamelessly borrowed from Wikipedia is a good visual demonstration of what's going on, and it explains things better than I could do in words. This is a way to help create complex looking surfaces with fewer polygons. If you get up close you can see the trick, but it works well enough most of the time, and it importantly responds realistically to dynamic moving light sources. This is something used all over the place in Rebel Strike, though it can be sort of hard to see, especially in the original standard resolution. The ridges on these sand dunes are bump mapped and they do respond to the slowly moving sun. The shadows change, but it is a bit too slow and a bit too subtle to show here, really. There's also bump mapping on the ships too. Certain elements, little details are bump mapped, something that it's a bit easier to see, but still quite subtle. This short video clip on the Dolphin Emulator development blog with the main texture removed shows what's going on really well. As the ship moves, the bridges, the surface texture responds to light. Again, subtle, you could have played this game extensively and not noticed it, but it's a little extra that sort of helps the graphics slide into your subconscious. Both of these techniques are really widely used in games today, but not so much 20 years ago. Yeah, Rogue Squadron 3 is definitely a forward-thinking game, but honestly, Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader, Factor 5's previous title in the series, is really a better game. Not that Rebel Strike is at all bad, but well, it's maybe a little bit bloated and the on-foot sections are a bit clunky. Rogue Squadron 2 pushes the GameCube only, marginally less, and it's still really, really impressive. It still looks gorgeous, it's still got the self-shadowing and the bump mapping, but it also has the benefit of some more iconic moments from the original trilogy being recreated. But I think this is going to be the end of the video. I think Factor 5's output is about as good as it gets graphically on the GameCube, but that's not to say there aren't other games I could have mentioned. I feel like a lot of people will complain that I've missed out the Metroid Prime games. Yeah, they are absolutely amazing, some of the greatest games of all time, but well, they will have to wait for another video. As will, well, loads of other things. Star Fox Adventures is another one, maybe Eternal Darkness too, but, well, I think I've talked enough for now. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all my wonderful Patreons. Your help really does make a difference. If you would like to join them, all these wonderful people up here, there is a link below. That would be absolutely fabulous. And I will say, as I always do, thanks for watching and goodbye.